Mary, I'm going to have to begin this interview with a confession, which is that I am not one of those men who thinks about the Roman Empire on a regular basis. Oh, well, I'm that sorry. is... I was going to quiz you about why you thought about the Roman Empire so often, I assumed that you did. I'm afraid not, and it turns out actually on reading your book I realised that I would have been taught some kind of Roman history at school, but I think it was a very long time ago, so I don't know much, and therefore of course this was a revelatory read for lots of reasons. Yeah, yeah. well I, I do tend to think, I mean I don't know why all those guys think about it so often, it's kind of, you know, I think it's about some sort of macho fantasy. Yeah. Um, but, you know, who knows? Who knows? I, mean, I suppose what I think is, um, well, OK, if there's some interest out there, come and get more interested and read differently. But I think that a lot of people, and I suspect you might be one of them, feel a little bit frightened of Roman imperial history mm -hmm. because you think, oh, God, I don't really know anything about this. And then there are all these emperors and I don't know their names and I don't know whether... Antoninus Pius came before or after Marcus Aurelius. Oh, um, and I think that, well, I hope this worked for you, but one of the things I've been trying to say in the book is it doesn't matter. Mm. You know, the Romans didn't know the history of their emperors either, you mm. know. So uh, there's a, I illustrate a, a wonderful little papyrus in the book, actually, which is a guy, very educated handwriting from Roman Egypt writing, writing on this scrap of papyrus and he's, he's writing a list of Roman emperors mm. with their dates and he gets it wrong. You know, and I thought, and if somebody asked me to write a list of British kings, English kings, yeah. I get it. I mean, tell me what you know about Edward III, Will. I think, very, very little. But <laughs> you don't need to have that kind of information yeah. to ask quite different and I think more interesting sorts of questions. So is that so? This book has a sort of thematic approach. So you look at this idea of emperorhood and how it affects sort of different areas. So was that sort of partly the reason to have it like that? That makes it far more accessible for the common reader. I hope so. I mean, it's it's really on picking the job description of the yeah. Roman emperor in in our terms, and uh, you know, I I try to be. I hope I am reassuring. So look, if you need to know who a particular emperor mm. is, I will tell you. Mm. But by and large, don't get worried about the names. There's a list of them at the beginning. Mm. You know, if you really want to be nerdish, go and look at the list. But most emperors are very like every other emperor, yeah. really. And, you know, today, what Marcus Aurelius, who's still famous because of his meditations, best-selling book, Meditation, um, he said at one point, and I thought, right, OK, that's my cue. He looked back at his predecessors and he said, same play, different cast. Right. And so my job is to say, don't worry, go with the flow, and we'll think about what these guys did, what mm. they ate, how they travelled, who served them, how they ran the Roman Empire. There are many, you've mentioned a few there. We'll start with food, actually, because your, your sort of section on dining is so interesting because it covers lots of different things. Uh, as you say, the sort of imperial dining was a place where people would be able to assert their status. It was all about the emperor showing that he was yeah. top dog. And of course, who is sat next to him or near him, who has his ear. Yeah. Um, but there's also the peril and the danger that comes from dining. Yeah. This idea of poisoned food being a yeah. constant worry. Is murder on the menu? That's yeah. always yeah. the question. I think dining's interesting because it's one place where the popular movie image has got it right. You know, mm. We all know if we go to a, a, to a movie about Roman emperors, they, at some point they're going to be lying down, reclining, saying, pass the grapes, please, Marcus. Mm. They? That's, you know, that's how you know you're in a Roman movie. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, I think that was a Roman image too. If they thought about the emperor, one of the rubbles they saw in him was at dinner. And they really wanted to get an invite, you know? They wanted to get an invite because it was the time you could bend the emperor's ear, mm. um, you, could, you could feel important, and I just, it's very like now. Mm. And I know that, you know, were I ever to be invited to you know, 
a royal dinner. You know, I, you know, I know that status would be very important. I know that I would not be next to the king. I would be, um, you know, on the bottom table yeah. somewhere. But there would still be that sense that we were dining together, and it was, um, it was kind of a mark of everybody's status yeah. when we were there in the palace. And I think that is like what it was like in Rome. But I think that if we were to go to a banquet at Buckingham Palace, um, you know, we'd wonder quite how, you know, how important we were and, mm. you know, where, where we came in the hierarchy, but we wouldn't um, be worrying all the time about poisoning. Mm. You know? I mean, so you know, we, if we got food poisoning yeah. in Buckingham Palace, that because of a terrible mistake in the kitchen, <laughs> it wouldn't, wouldn't be because somebody had been um, adulterating our food. Yeah. And so you've got something very similar about our own kind of dining in Rome. But you've got the added extra of, it, of the dinner dinner table being a crime scene. Mm. And, you know, it seems to me in some ways that it's the the banquet, particularly the imperial banquet in Rome, is about as classic a crime scene mm. as the English country house mm. is in a kind of modern crime fiction. You know, the, you know Professor Plum with the lead piping in the library. And, you know, dinner was a place of privilege, of luxury, but also danger, mm. and are often associated with poisoning, and always suspicious. And I think that you, we know about the fears of poisoning, not only because of stories of people dropping down dead at dinner, but also because we have the tombstones of people who worked as palace poison tasters. Yeah. And you kind of think, okay, so, you go to dinner with the emperor, and there's all these guys around the back. Some of them are serving, but some of them are tasting the emperor's food. Mm. Now, you might say, well, that's a very wise precaution. Uh, the emperor wants to make sure that he isn't being poisoned by persons unknown. But as soon as you've got those guys there, it reminds everybody that poisoning might be. Right actually happening yeah you know you could you can't take precautions against it without exposing it and there are wonderful stories about that sort of suspicion that's mm. a great story of um a, an imperial princess who wasn't on good terms with the reigning emperor but he invites her to dinner nonetheless and at one point he says well, have, a, have a piece of fruit and she lift, lifts an apple out of the bowl and then she thinks Hang on, mm. right? How do I know that? And she hesitates, but she sees there's nothing she can do. So she hesitates for a moment and then bites into it. The emperor notices the hesitation mm. and, and works out that she has suspected him of poisoning. Next thing you know, she's in exile. Sure, and there's, you make clear, actually, there's sort of an element of theatre to a lot of these events. Yeah. And uh, we have these stories that have come down, and it's hard to know sometimes how true those stories are. But the point you often make in the book is the storytelling is the point. That's absolutely. I mean, I, I, mean, I think too many ancient historians, mm. you know, modern ancient historians, have tried to go through all these stories. And they're wonderful. You know, they're, mm. they're the kind of stories about power and its use and abuse that, you know, that echo down the centuries. You know, mm. The Emperor Domitian skewering flies with his you know, or Tiberius having his private parts nibbled mm. in the swimming pool, you know, this kind of stuff. They're kind of, they, they've been seen on movies many times. Uh, and it, there is a temptation to say, well, are they true? Come on, are they true? And the fact is we can't know if they're true. We can't know if they're total fantasy, whether they're exaggerations, or absolutely literally the case. But what I try to do is that it doesn't actually matter because we learn huge amounts about how people thought about emperors from those kind of anecdotes. Mm. Just as we learn huge amounts about what we think about royal family mm. from the no doubt utterly, utterly unreliable things that we sometimes read in the newspaper. You know, <laughs> we, you know the stories about Harry and Meghan mm. are really important about how we think about our royals operating mm. 
And it doesn't actually matter in that sense if you're a historian. Yeah. If they're true. Is that you are when you're pulling from the sources, you're often you're looking at writings that have remained. And I was fascinated to hear about these sort of letters that have been copied again and again and carved into walls or sheets of yeah. bronze. Yeah. Um, and then you're also looking at archaeological evidence, like literally the series of small walls that we all know from our trips to the sort of Roman sites in Britain. And th there's often this weird thing where there are huge amounts we don't know. So you point out that in many of the houses, there are lots of rooms surrounding a central area, and we don't know what those rooms are for. You don't, you don't see a huge kitchen, so you make the point that we maybe those big meals that we say I, maybe these wouldn't have been possible, or certainly not on a regular basis. I don't. I mean, I, I think that there must be occasional display meals. Yeah. But on the main pa imperial palace in Rome, which you can still visit, um, no one's ever found a kitchen. Right. Now, it could be that they were sort of at a distance. Um, that may be the case. Yeah. But we, it's not like you, know, you go to the top carpet palace in Istanbul, you know, there's vast kitchens. Yeah. You think, God, this was a great cooking display culture. Yeah. Rome looks as if it ought to be like that, but we don't see it. Really? The other thing about dining is I don't really see how you can tuck in to a vast plate of wild boar if you are reclining yeah. on a couch, supporting yourself with one hand. Yeah. You've got only one hand to eat with. They don't really have forks, because forks haven't really been invented yet. Mm. And, and I say, well, mostly this must be tapas. This, you know, this isn't meat and two veg. No. You haven't, you haven't got two hands to eat with. Yeah. And I, I kind of suspect that there would be ceremonial entrances of some great hunk, probably, of rather well, sad meat yeah. um, coming in. Um, and then it would all be removed and cut up into tiny tapas cut of bits. Yeah, so That's Roman right. finger food is what you're smelling. Right. It has to be. Yeah, I see a, a chain of restaurants ahead of you, Mary, that you could set up. Roman tapas could be the future of the British Roman tapas, meets. yeah. You know, doorbell slick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the other fascinating things, uh, as I said, was there were lots of things we, we can't know about some of these buildings, and yet some really interesting, minute detail about the people who worked in them. Yeah. There are these memorials uh, of people who had all sorts yeah. of interesting jobs, yeah. and from that you can tell how things actually work. Yeah, I think you can. And for me, what became really interesting about the Emperor was not just to write about him and to make this a book about you know, one very posh white man, right? Mm. Um, it was that you could see the people who made his life possible and you could see what they did and sort of how they were organised in the palace. You know, and they're doing jobs like um, handbag carrier to the empress, um, masseurs, mm. napkin surveyor, right? or uh, the, the man who is in charge of the emperor's outfits that he wears to the theatre. Mm. You know, these minute um, specialisms, mostly done by slaves. I mean, this was, the Roman palace was built on the labour of thousands of slaves. They sometimes were given, quite often probably, given their freedom, but they still went on mm. working in the palace. But you start to see a whole community there. I went to Rome last week actually and there's there is one area of the palace that you can be pretty certain was largely populated by the, the slaves who worked there. Don't quite know what, what it was for, but we can see from the graffiti on the wall uh, that it's slaves and they're you know, they're being jocular and they're being rude mm. like Roman graffiti artists always are. But you you find just it's quite moving. They're leaving their names and where they originally came from. And I was with a friend who were trying to kind of decode them because it, Roman handwriting is awful. Yeah. Quite hard to read. And then we, we found this guy who was Bassus from Kherson. He comes from Ukraine. Mm. You know, and the, so he was wanting to tell us where he was from. Mm. And he would have never imagined that 2,000 years later, you know, Kherson would be a, a a place that was 
look familiar to us from modern gym. Yeah, extraordinary. Uh, the um, the things that get left behind are, of course, all you have to work from, uh, and sometimes, as you say, there's sort of this decoding that you have to do to work out what the significance is of certain things. Most people will be familiar with the idea of sort of Roman statuary. Um, and yet, as you point out, have all these busts that have become separated from their pedestal, so it's quite hard to work out who they actually are, um, even, even if it's somebody terribly important like the emperor himself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that you have a sort of gallery of, of faces, but then you make the point that, of course, they look quite similar because they're done in a certain style yeah. and they show this idea of succession from That's one right. emperor to the they other. Do. They do. And, you know, I think uh, it's a bit like the sort of rebarbative feel of the emperor's names. You know, there's nothing which is more off-turning in a museum than a whole row of look-alike Romans who were probably emperors, um, yeah. but we're not absolutely certain whether they are. And, you know, I, I watch people just walk past those, and in fact, you know, true confession, I walk past them. <laughs> you know, it's not, um, you think, oh, you know, come back one day. Um, but in some ways, it's quite interesting to think, look, the point is they do all look the same. Yeah. You know, when I uh, was thinking about how emperors are more similar to each other than they are different, mm. um, that's what the statues say. You know, they're, they're creating a brand image which is pretty look-alike. The faces are slightly different. Mm. Um, so when they're just bust, you can see slightly different facial features. But all the bodies are the same. Now, if, you know, with the English monarchs, we're kind of used to them being Henry VIII, you know, fat. You know, there's, yeah. there's no fat there's, you know, on a Roman emperor in any full-length statue. Mm. And they are, they're trading on their similarity, mm. at least in a public image. I mean, heaven knows what they, what they were really like. And yeah. if you go to biographies, you find all sorts of descriptions of these guys which don't look a bit like <laughs> what their statues are. Augustus has got you know, yellow gappy teeth and terrible spotty back. Yeah. Well, you'd never guess that. <laughs> no. I guess it's, I mean, in a modern sense, we would talk about branding. And you sort of make the point that Roman coins, which of course are a very common thing that people understand, that was partly a branding exercise. It was about getting your face out there, and of course, those coins distributed across Absolutely. the empire so that everyone knows who Absolutely. you are, why you're everywhere. And it was radically new. I mean, we take it for granted. We just assume mm. that there's going to be a monarch's face on the coins. That's you know, so what? Mm. Julius Caesar was the first living Roman to put his head on the coins. Mm. It was hugely controversial. Mm. There'd been dead Romans' heads on right. the coins. You know, for centuries, yeah. but not the living person. And that becomes absolute central branding of, of what imperial power is about. Mm. And it's very hard now to capture how radical it was. Mm. It must have been absolutely, you know, in your face new. Um, we began talking about this sort of idea of why people might be thinking about the Roman Empire so frequently in today's world. It's clear that people, that it has a fascination, and I wonder if there are sort of, when you're looking at this idea of emperorhood, this idea of leadership, and of course autocratic leadership, this idea you know, that you are the sole leader. When we look at the modern world, are there certain leaders that, whose behavior we should be looking at and thinking, oh, that's a little bit close to that sort of dictatorship? Who you Probably like. all of them, <laughs> I think, actually. I mean, this, I remember when Trump was president, and that, uh, the, the most common question I got from journalists was, which Roman emperor is he most like? Yeah, yeah. You know, and you had to say, now look, in some ways he's not like any. You know, I'm sorry, I'm not going to say Nero. I know that's what you want me yeah. to say. Um, and I think it's not a question of kind of tying them up, you know, one particular character to one particular leader. But I think that across leaders, whether they are monarchs or uh, autocrats or democratically elected leaders, you find some of the same problems being talked about. Mm. And I think one of those that comes out really clearly with Roman emperors is, is the emperor just a performer? And it, sometimes you get a kind of hot spot of that sort of questioning, like around the Emperor Nero, mm. who um, controversially performed on stage. 
um, controversially had his speeches written for him by somebody else, so as if he was just an actor. Mm. Now, I think that we worry about that too, actually. Sometimes we just forget about it. But, you know, I think that when we see um, the Prime Minister pretending to fill up somebody else's car with petrol, as if it was an ordinary bloke, but well, we know he doesn't drive whatever it was. We also think, is, he, is this just all a play act? Mm. Are they pretending? Mm. What's the level of pretense in power? Then sorry, you might say, well, it has to be pretense. You know, you've, that's the only way you can do it, by pretending to be leader. You're not really a superhuman leader of the Western world. You're an ordinary bloke pretending to be that. Mm. Um, but Romans were very good at, at discussing those issues. And they were very acute. And I think that's where the sort of anecdotage um, comes in too, because we, you know, we, we do tend to think that this is just kind of idiosync idiosyncratic stories about mm. kind of slightly mad Roman leaders. Actually, people are telling these stories to really reach to some of those big issues. Is this guy just an act? It's a good question on which to finish, Mary. We'll leave that hanging in the air. But <laughs> as I say, I found this a revelatory read. I realised how little I knew about the Roman Empire. I feel it may be something I think about on a more regular basis from now on. Uh, I feel my job has, job has been done. done. <laughs> Thank you so much for telling me more about the book today. Thank you.